Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Greg Serpa, who is a clinical psychologist for the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs at the VA Greater Los Angeles uh, Healthcare System. Um, he is quite distinctive and has very interesting background and now has the specific distinction of not simply training uh, psychology students and all different uh, disciplines of students, social work residents and postdoctoral fellows in psychiatry and nurses in mindfulness, but also um, he's head director of interprofessional mental health education for the VA and UCLA, and he's the national mindfulness content expert for the VA's Office of Patient-Centered Care. So it's with great pleasure I welcome Dr. Serpa. Great. Thank you, Dr. Callender. It's a pleasure to be here. So I welcome everyone here that's online. My name again is Greg Serpa, and I'm the mindfulness guy for the VA, and I teach uh, at the VA and elsewhere um, also. And I, sometimes it's nice with everything that's going on. Um, that's a lot right now as we are doing this uh, distance learning uh, during uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, just to land a little bit, to ground a little bit into the wisdom of the body. So I invite you, I will start um, our talk today with maybe just a three or four minute mindfulness practice, a little grounding practice. So I invite you to sit up in your chair and usually it's good to have both of your feet flat on the ground, but letting your own posture kind of decide um, what helps you feel supported and at ease. And if it's helpful for you, inviting you to close the eyes, although that's not required. You can have a soft gaze maybe down towards the floor. and bring awareness into your feet as best you can. Maybe sensing the lower legs and the weight of the lower legs, pushing the soles of the feet into the floor. Maybe sensing there's more weight in the balls of your feet or the heels of your feet. And just noticing if there's any weight in the big toes or the little toes. and shifting your attention as best you can up into the torso and the legs, noticing the buttocks, the backs of the legs, and how they're in contact with the chair. And maybe noticing the lower back. Maybe the elbows are in contact with the chair, maybe not. And can you let the chair do the work to support you? Can you let go of striving? And as best you can now directing your attention to your breath. Breathing in and breathing out. And if it's accessible to you, inviting a sense of ease into the breath.
and noticing the next breath. And in just a moment, I'll ring a bell to indicate the end of our brief grounding practice. And gently opening your eyes. And welcoming you to this, yourself to this new moment with all that it holds right now. Maybe some uncertainty, maybe some stress. Um, this moment finds me involved in homeschooling. So do forgive me if I have a uh, fourth grader burst into my guest room here. Uh, these are interesting times that we're in. And this is certainly true to those of us that are trying to hold center in our own families and um, that are trying to be of service to our communities and to the world. And I know I'm in good company and deeply grateful for everyone uh, whose life work is to take care of others and to diminish human suffering. So um, I'm really grateful and happy to be in this, in this crowd. And that uh, also being said is that this is hard on us. Um, and this is especially true for supervisors and those that are dealing with um, other folks who might be struggling understandably and having a hard time. So there's multiple fronts. You might have individual patients, your own supervisees, issues going on in your own families and your own lives during this time. And it can be a lot. Uh, and that is um, okay. There, we don't have to be 100% all the time. As a matter of fact, that is impossible. Uh, but our stance is very important. And this brings us to our topic for the day, which is mindfulness and how this interfaces with the work that we do. So I am hopeful that I can, my, my one overarching goal for this talk today is to dispel the notion that mindfulness means relaxation. So um, I am not sure how you felt with that grounding practice. Maybe you settled a bit, but maybe as you paused and you brought some awareness into the body, it is equally possible that you might have noticed, wow, a whole lot's going on right now. I'm not feeling settled or easy or, or at peace or any of these things. I must be doing it wrong in some way. And um, that's actually, um, very important about what we're talking about is what mindfulness is, its function, and how we can use this in our clinical work and in our supervision. So I like to use the John Kabat-Zinn definition for mindfulness. Um, many of you will know of John Kabat-Zinn and his work. He's the founder of mindfulness-based stress reduction, which he started in 1979 at the University of Massachusetts Worcester campus. Uh, and uh, I've been teaching uh, MBSR for, for many years. Um, and that's one of the classes that I teach. So John uses the definition that mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. That's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of bits. So this is something we do on purpose in the present moment right now in a particular way and without judgment. 
that in a particular way, how are we paying attention to our experience? And I want to take just a minute to unpack that. We pay attention to our experience with openness, with curiosity, and with kindness is the stance that we're trying to cultivate. We don't always embody that, especially in times like this. Um, I'm going to uh, do a little test for you. Not a pencil and paper test, but a kind of behavioral test. Um, imagining that you can't find your wallet. If you look in your purse or your backpack or your briefcase or you reach into your back pocket or whatever it is and your wallet's gone. And you scramble into the car and if you drive and it's not there and you scramble home and you look at all the places it might not be, it, it might be and it's not there. What is it that you say to yourself? What is your self-talk? Um, I invite you to be really curious about this, right? Um, I think this is a pretty funny thing. Sometimes people will say like, oh, you dummy, or oh, where did you leave it? And can't you do anything right? And you know, there's some like judgments in there. Sometimes there's scorching judgments. Sometimes nothing at all. Maybe it's a little like, ah, oh, it's all right, you'll find it, or you won't, you're okay. Um, whatever it is, I invite you personally to be curious about what your self-talk is. Why? We go through our lives with this self-talk going on in our heads all the time. And this is really uh, a, an important lesson that it isn't um, subliminal. We are aware of our thoughts, but we are so habituated to our stance towards ourselves that we don't even hear what we say to ourselves each day, every day, all day long. So if it's you stupid idiot with some curse words thrown in there, um, I just want to throw out this idea of common humanity. Is there anyone on this call that has never lost a wallet or a driver's license or car keys or something like that? Um, and isn't it fair to say that having done that doesn't mean we're an idiot or a loser or whatever, but that in fact, this makes us human, like everyone else here, like everyone listening to this, that we in fact are human. And this is our common humanity. This actually doing things like this is part of the human experience. It doesn't make us an idiot and a loser. This is a little thing. But it's a big thing, because if you are inside your head with this snide internal monologue that's constantly telling you that you're not doing enough, that you're not good enough, that this is wrong, that that's wrong, that you forgot this and you forgot that, that is actually acting as an anchor on your mood. And one of the things I study in my scientific work is it's down-regulating your immune function in ways that we can measure uh, through the microbiome, through, I do brain neuroimaging, uh, we can measure uh, the negative impacts of, of that. Uh, and this is actually what mindfulness is, right? Mindfulness is not relaxation training. That's, I think, the number one kind of myth, uh, that it's relaxation training. It isn't relaxation training. It is bringing our attention to this moment with whatever we find and treating it with a little bit of kindness and grace. And right now, I, I can't speak for you, but I'll speak for myself. Um, it's hard. I have a whole bunch of trainees that have transitioned to distance um, uh, clinical care. And there's been a lot going on with the technology. Uh, and um, they're, uh, you know, some of them are far from home um, and are isolating in their 
at their own homes now and are going through a lot of stress and trying to hold all of that. I, I'm doing homeschooling. Um, we, it's just a, a busy time. I'm worried about my very elderly parents um, and their access to care and food. Uh, and that's a lot. And how I hold myself during this time is of vital importance. Holding myself with a little bit of kindness and with a little bit of ease. So it might make sense that I don't feel totally relaxed, but I can't imagine not um, having my practice to rely on right now. Uh, that just helps me ground in, ground into the wisdom of the body. So it's not about relaxation and it is about being with our present moment experience just as we are with kindness and this means being with ourselves with kindness not just when we're on fuego and we do everything just right that's the easy part right when we've had like one of those rare superstar days when the planets align and everything it's like everything gets done and everything feels good and it's like I feel actually pretty good about all that <laughs> sometimes that happens most of the time it doesn't uh, most of the time it's like we're like having those in between days and some of the times we even have one of those days that nothing feels like it's going right that it is one disaster after another that it is one crisis that should, in our minds, have been averted and wasn't, and one struggle after another. All of this, all of it, um, is what we hold ourselves with kindness. It's like this too makes a human life. The full tapestry of what it means to be alive. When you can't find your keys and when things don't go right, and being human just as we are. So that's a little bit of an intro about what mindfulness is. And I will say it's a very common misperception that people think that it's about relaxation. Mm -hmm. And it's not. We are cultivating attention. Um, but we're also cultivating an attitude that we bring to our attention. And this is that attitude of openness, of curiosity, and of kindness. So I just wanted to check with Dr. Fallender about kind of where we are. Um, and uh, I wanted to just talk briefly. I, I introduced what my infamous was. Uh, and I wanted to do, maybe do a practice a little bit later, but also uh, deliver some like concrete skills that might be used. That would be great. I also would love if you would touch upon the idea we talked in trauma-informed clinical supervision about how supervisors uh, in that model can help their supervisees metabolize their experience uh -huh. and um, not ruminate, cut into the rumination through the metabolism that could occur during supervision. So if you could address that as well, that would be really helpful. Great. So that brings me maybe to my first discussion point. So that's, um, that, that's good timing. And this is the inevitable tension that exists in supervisors and in clinical work. Um, this tension between fixing, curing, healing, and allowing and letting be. And how is that manifest in the supervisorial relationship a lot, where there's this evaluative process that you're wanting to enhance the skills and evaluate and prepare, you know, supervisees uh, as, as you're working with them, but also um, um, accept and support and help them metabolize their experience. And that both of these things can be simultaneously true. So if I can figure out my technology, I think I can. I'm quite um, confident I can figure it out. Okay. <laughs> I actually had a poem I wanted to read. Um, I may have to put my glasses on for that.
Okay. So, um, this poem I particularly love because it, uh, it's about 850 years old and it kind of speaks to this. So, uh, it's a roomy poem called two kinds of intelligence. And, uh, it's about from 1270 or so. There are two kinds of intelligence. One acquired as a child in school, memorizing facts and concepts from books and from what the teacher says, collecting information from the traditional sciences as well as the new sciences. With such intelligences, you rise in the world and you get ranked ahead or behind others in regard to your competence in retaining information. You stroll with this information in and out of fields of knowledge, getting always more marks on your preserving tablets. There is another kind of tablet, one already completed and preserved inside of you a spring overflowing its spring box, a freshness in the center of your chest. This other intelligence does not turn yellow or stagnate. It's fluid and it doesn't move from outside to in through conduits of plumbing learning. This second knowledge is a fountainhead that is within you that moves out. Being a supervisor means um, having access to both of those sources of knowledge and wisdom. Um, that it's more than books and knowing and figuring things out, uh, but it's also trusting the innate wisdom and capacity of the body and being able to, fit, to navigate that dialectical tension. So one of the funny things about that is how do you know? Um, how do you know when you need to think from this part of your brain or that part or from one thing or another? And I, I will say that uh, there was a study done with Fortune 50 companies, uh, really about uh, CEOs, about how you make good decisions. Where do good decisions come from? The best decisions you made in your corporate life. Of course, this is outside of what we do, but I think still think it's an interesting idea. So, you know, CEOs that are paid huge bucks that have, uh, you know, just armies of analytic folks. And every one of them says the same thing. They say, you know, yeah, I look at the data. I read through everything, but... You know, I, I trust my gut. I, I listen to my own gut. Okay? So if we are to say to each of you, where is your neural tissue? And it's, of course, a trick question. Uh, when we say, where's your neural tissue? And everyone is like, uh, like, duh, like my brain. Actually, it is all over spinal cord, brain, brain stem, spinal cord, and that gut. Um, you know, there's so much uh, information processing that takes that happens in the gut that we know. Um, so, you know, my uh, one of my UCLA appointments is at the Center for the Neurobiology of Stress, and we study mind body interventions and gut microbiome brain interventions, right? That interface. And really a lot is going on in our guts too. So the invitation as a supervisor is that you access all of your capacity. Not just what you might, the specific skills that you might follow um, in, in Carol's excellent books or the skills that you are learning here, but what feels in your gut and, and you're integrating all of this information. And sometimes there's all these choice points. How do you know? It's like, hmm, you know, these, I'm making these decisions. How do you know? And this word for the day here is discernment 
right, is to discern between what feels right. Um, and in this clinical situation with this event that's happening, what feels right. And for discernment, um, I am going to suggest that the, the best kind of, of decisions come when, of course, there's consultation and there's collaboration with others and there's all of these, these, these mechanisms, uh, but that you're also integrating this information in, in your own body and you're listening to your own gut about kind of what feels right. That's informed by following the evidence, um, getting consultation from others, and integrating this all together. That's how we can make good decisions and um, discern kind of the wise path forward. And it's not always easy to do. So um, I wanted to actually transition just a little bit and talk about uh, how not to be so reactive. How not to um, fall into uh, a trap of responding and, and, and reacting uh, so much. Um, so this is actually the difference between reacting and responding, um, where, um, you know, we reacting to events might just be kind of uh, uh, a reflex that we just react or we, we say certain things or, or whatever. And maybe um, the task at hand requires a more skillful response, which we um, get with through a little bit of reflection and through a little pause. So I was, um, let me just think if I can, share a screen. Oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to feel so fancy if I can do this. Great. Look at this. Wow. Very proud of myself. So um, what we're doing is learning about the acronym called STOP. The S of STOP stands simply for STOP. T stands for take a breath. The O is observe. And I'll go through these in just a minute, a little bit more. And the P stands for proceed. Is that right? How do you spell proceed? You know, if you're in a supervision or in a clinical situation that a lot is going on, STOP is a super useful acronym. And I really wanted to ensure that we gave you some concrete tools during the talk today. All right, just stop. You don't need to say anything right this second. Take a breath all the way into your toes. You know, just all the way in to the bottom of your feet. Take a breath. And O is you're observing. What do you observe? You're observing everything. What's going on in my body? What, what does my heart say about this? What does my thinking mind say about this? And you're integrating, taking that moment to integrate that information. And the P is proceed. Proceed in a way that feels right and true. Uh, instead of just reacting. Um, and this is <coughs> a super useful tool that I've used for a couple decades now um, in supervision with trainees who, who are coming in um, and sometime without um, all the uh, you know, years of experience and, and practice uh, and have to share something and um, you know, it's, we can take it on as, as supervisors and just to stop and take a moment, um, that take a breath and observe what's happening, integrate all this information, you know, what they're telling you, what you think is right clinically, what the system requires, ethics, the whole enchilada, and then proceeding in a way that feels right. 
right? So um, that's the stop technique for you. Great. And do you advocate using that with the supervisees? Because part of that trauma-informed model is helping their, uh, them to be more in touch with their self-regulatory um, capacities or to kind of, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is a skill for um, supervisees too, um, just to kind of tune in uh, to what's happening. We're using the um, we're using the soma, the entire body, to support our work. Right? We're not, uh, and this is really interesting about our work. You know, most of our work. The reason we can do this much of a tele, most of our work is talking and thinking. Um, yes, yeah, sometimes we're writing notes and we're using our fingers, uh, but. Um, we're not using our body most of the time for the type of work that we do here. Uh, so that is why a technique like this that helps you to use and integrate the information from the body um, into decision-making and into helping metabolize uh, what's happening is so useful. And it's something that trainees can be taught. Uh, there are a whole lot of practices. Some are bare noting practices practices that we use an anchor for the present moment and um, we pay attention to that experience with kindness whether it's sensations in the body or the breath or sound or anything like that the, the, there's other types of practices besides spare noting and that's where we're trying to warm up our experience a little bit that we're trying to add kindness or compassion or gratitude mm -hmm. or we're trying to cultivate one of these experiences um, in our own mind or heart and with any of these practices we may or may not experience those things. So we open the door, we invite them in, and sometimes when we're trying to cultivate kindness or, or compassion or generosity or any of those traits, they're not there. Um, and all we're noticing is we're bored or it's, we're, we're itchy or restless or whatever. And that's just fine. That's just fine. We can't make ourselves feel anything, but we try to notice what's there. And if it's kind of a positive feeling and we want to amplify it a bit, but that's okay too. Okay, so we'll do a practice that I call compassionate breathing. And you'll see how that goes. Sitting up in your chair. And Inviting you to gently close your eyes if that feels okay for you. And maybe we'll do this for, and I'll say maybe five or seven minutes, just to give you a sense of how long it'll be. And bringing your awareness into today's body, right here, just as you are, right here in this moment. And asking you to start by noticing your breathing. And maybe on your next inhale, elongate the inhale just a bit. Making it longer than you normally would inhale. And then as you exhale, Elongating the exhale. And maybe doing that one more time or twice more. Just for you to get a sense that you are actually in a body that's alive and it's breathing right now. Inviting you now to pay attention to the inhale. 
sensing the inhale portion of the breath cycle. The inhale. And as you're breathing in, maybe there's an awareness. This air that you're breathing in right here, breathing in, is directly connected to your life. And asking you to imagine on this air that you're breathing in, With each breath you're breathing in, it's not just oxygen you're taking into your body, but compassion and kindness. That you're taking in this kindness into your body Asking you to imagine all the people in your community that rely on you, that rely on all of us as providers. And actually each of them wishes you well and wants you to be healthy and wants you to be at ease and wants you to be whole. And with each inhale as you breathe in, bringing some of that kindness into your own body, allowing it to be just for you. And if you're ready now, if it feels right, inviting you to pay attention to the exhale portion of your breath, the breathing out and the letting go. As you exhale, letting go of any tension Any troubles that don't serve you right here in this moment. Simply giving yourself permission to let go. On your next exhale, just imagining now that as you breathe out, some of the abundant kindness and compassion that resides inside your own body, you're sending out into the world. This kindness and compassion, imagine sending it out to everyone else on this recording. With each exhale, sending out kindness, support, compassion to everyone in your community, especially now. Sending out kindness to all the frontline responders. hospital workers, with each breath, 
may, be, may they be well. And now if it feels all right to you, paying attention to the entire breath cycle. Breathing in and then breathing out. The taking in kindness just for you on the inhale and the sending it out for everyone else on the exhale. This may require that you give yourself some explicit permission that you too are worthy of kindness and compassion. And taking it in and letting it be just for you. And breathing it out for everyone else. And in just a moment, we'll close the practice with the bell. And inviting you to wiggle your fingers and toes a bit, give your body any kind of kindness that it might need. Flutter your eyes open and check in with how you're doing in this new moment. I would just offer that perhaps by personality, those of us in caregiver professions uh, are drawn to these roles because we like taking care of other people. And that's part of what how we're made, a part of our fabric. And sometimes we in particular struggle to take in the good just for us. That that is usually really good for us to send it out and maybe not so good to take it in. And this is very important work um, in supervision and in um, behavioral health in general, that we too are, are worthy of kindness and compassion, and we have some sort of practice that we know that we can take in the good. I think it's incredibly helpful. Um, I think it's just a toe in the water of all of this, but I think it's such important practice. So a little bit about your own self-care. Um, if you, uh, as people that provide behavioral health, especially that are uh, in, uh, hearing trauma, uh, there's this uh, possibility of vicarious traumatization. And I invite you all to be curious about your specific signals about what you do when your cup is full and when you're shutting down. Um, whether, and this is for your trainees to start learning, uh, of course, as well, but even uh, especially as a supervisor, um, you know, what is it that you disengage? Is it that you start thinking about the um, uh, your shopping list? Is it that you have a flight to fantasy? Is it that you think, oh, this person, you know, you're, you start imagining how much they're not like you. Uh, you know, there's all these kind of things that we do. And I offer this idea that it's important to figure out that what your habit is. What is it, what's your thing that you do? Um, I'm, I have a lot of energy and one of the things that I find myself doing is like when I start thinking, oh, what do I have to get to? And I, and I start doing my to-do list and, I'm, and I get a lot of energy about my to-do list. And for me, that's my signal of, ooh, what am I avoiding right here? Mm -hmm. 
And how can I help a trainee metabolize some of the impact of their work by being fully present in here, mm -hmm. instead of thinking, what am I doing in my next clinical encounter or supervision, right? So knowing what, where we are, what our go-to is when we're trying to get away from it, and, and being able to be with experience. And how do you communicate that to the supervisees? You probably don't talk to them about your to-do list, but maybe you do. But how do you communicate that to help to model for them? Right, right. Uh, I invite uh, curiosity a lot about what's happening with you now mm -hmm. and, and what's going on. And sometimes I can be really transparent because that's helpful i think for trainees too mm -hmm. to hear something like wow i just noticed that i like checked out for a minute mm -hmm. yeah and i think i did that because this is such a painful story to hear mm -hmm. and i'm i'm wondering how it was for you to hear this mm -hmm. so you know being human and and talking about that one of the things I, one of the reasons I picked that specific practice, uh, the compassionate breathing, is that is a really good way to expand your bandwidth capacity for how much you can stay connected when you're hearing difficult material. Mm -hmm. So if you're hearing material from a supervisee or a client that is just like, oh boy, I, and I'm pulling away from it, you can just thank compassion and for me and kindness for you and just do some of that compassionate breathing right there in the dyad for just a few breaths to help you stay connected to the content and to help the trainee feel supported and, and for you to feel them to feel that you're present with them because you are mm -hmm. uh, and that's really important work you told a story in the book about um, a group you were doing at the VA and a very disruptive client came in and kind of agitated and was accusing people of things and how you use these same similar kinds of strategies of kindness and compassion to kind of deal with it and the impact on the group. I remember that like really pushed me. So I was doing a large mindfulness group in our SUD uh, substance abuse unit. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there were 30 vets in there in a big room. And right in the middle of a long practice, we usually were doing 15 or 18, 20 minute practices in there of longer types of practices. Someone who was new opened the door and walked out into the middle of the group and was like, what? 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 And, you know, cussed a little bit. And, you know, like everyone like opened their eyes and some of the guys were like reactive. And I tried to like wave the guy to a chair and he wasn't having it. And he was a little kind of rough with me and rough to everyone in there. Um, and I was like, okay, everyone, yeah, but this is, you're welcome to come back to the group. And, you know, he wouldn't be in the group. So I kind of escorted them out very kindly because he wouldn't take a seat. And he was like surprised too much of what we were doing. And then I encouraged everyone to finish the meditation. And we did. And when it was all over, the guys were like hot. Um, about like how he was disrespectful and how he was probably loaded and all of this. And my comment was, um, and just imagine coming in here and not knowing what's going on and being struck by it and reacting. And they were all being protective of me because of the language he used and said, yeah, you should have, yeah, that wasn't right. That wasn't right. And, um, then there was a shift when a veteran said, wow, and you didn't react. He was saying all this stuff to you, saying how like lame and stupid and cussing and all that. And you didn't react and you were like kind to him. And it gave me such kind of incredible buy-in. Of course, that was my practice not to 
like react to all that and wanting to preserve the group, but I couldn't like triangulate it. I felt in that, in that moment, wow, I, I, maybe I could have done something a little better. I could have invited him in a little bit better and maybe transitioned him a little bit. Um, but the guys saw it really differently. They saw it as, you know, modeling kindness and acceptance, um, even when being verbally attacked. And they found it to be quite powerful um, in that moment. I had later heard that he was in fact intoxicated and had in, um, disrupted a couple of other groups um, that morning. But this, you know, how we respond to ourselves and to others is it can be quite uh, can be quite powerful, even if it's gentle. Yeah. No, I thought it was a very powerful. Uh, example for the reasons you're saying and also even for our work with our supervisees because I think sometimes we get kind of reactive with them because we're so shocked or overwhelmed or the trauma that they're reporting and what they did all those kinds of things so I think it's very interesting very yeah, interesting. yeah. so um, I think we're nearing pretty close to the end we talks a little bit about mindfulness, about it's not being relaxation, but about uh, uh, showing up and attending to what is, even now, mm -hmm. especially now. Uh, we talked about discernment and this dialectical tension that is going on between, you know, allowing and accepting and wanting change uh, between like, you know, checking all the boxes and following the rules and creating space. There's all these different dialectical tensions here and how we navigate that with discernment and wisdom and the information of the world bodies. Uh, we did talk about the STOP acronym uh, and I invite you and your supervisees just to think about whether it's STOP or something else, how can I be less reactive and continue to respond more skillfully in the moment. Mm -hmm. And then compassionate breathing. Some people call that one for me, one for you. You know, if there's a really effectively charged interaction, a little compassionate breathing can help you settle in and be less reactive and respond more skillfully. I should add also that Dr. Serpa did write a book with Dr. Wolf, who I believe is also at the VA. And it's about a clinician's guide to teaching mindfulness that I think is really, really wonderful. I am so appreciative that you took the time to meet with us and give us all these strategies. I think it's an amazing gift and we thank you. Oh, I thank you. And um, yes, it's uh, nice being in community and company with everyone. Uh, mm -hmm to the folks that uh, whose life work is to lessen human suffering. Mm -hmm. And um, noble work indeed, don't lose sight of that, hold on to that. And uh, I hope everyone stays well.